Uh, I think it's a couple minutes past. Yeah. Uh, so why don't we can go ahead and kick it off. So thank you all for joining the virtual tumor board for October 5th, uh, 2022. Uh, this one's on open and endoscopic approaches. And I guess there'll be some discussion of non-operative approaches to uh, laryngeal cancer. We're really excited uh, for today's session. Thank you very much to Riz Aslam from Tulane for organizing this as a liaison to the mucosal uh, section and, and uh, to our three case presenters, Diana Kirk from Mount Sinai, Samer Alcadari from Rush, Oriana uh, Geraldez uh, from the University of Puerto Rico, and then we have three expert discussants, Kendra Harris, uh, Radiation Oncology from Tulane, Andrew McWhorter, uh, LSU Voice Center on uh, um, Laryngology, and uh, Miriam Lango, Head and Neck Surgery at MD Anderson. So yeah, thank you all for being, uh, being here. Uh, for those who have not joined these before, so these are hour-long sessions. Each uh, will have three separate cases. We try and stick as close to the 20 minutes per case as we can. Um, uh, Jeff Liu has kindly agreed to help MC today's session and he'll help facilitate all uh, man the chat box. So if you have questions for during the cases, feel free to enter them in there and then we'll bring them back to uh, the open discussion. So without further ado, uh, why don't we kick it off with Diana's uh, first presentation. Okay, great. Let me just... Oh, and if you're not speaking, and I'll follow this after I say this, uh, go on mute, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be here and, and talk to you about open partial laryngectomy. As some of you may know, I'm dual fellowship trained in laryngology and head and neck surgery. So larynx cancer uh, certainly falls in, in my sweet spot of, of practice. So we'll kick off with the case and I'll, I'll throw out some questions to our, to our discussants. Um, so we have a 70, 70, 77 year old male here who presents with dysphonia for six months. He's otherwise pretty healthy and well, apart from hypertension and a history of GERD. He's an ex-smoker with a reported 20 pack year history um, and he's a drinker. Um, Loriano, I've heard so much about you. It's a pleasure to finally meet you in this setting, um, given that you're also at Sinai previously. Can you show me or tell me what you see here in this in this picture? Well, you have a right vocal fold uh, lesion um, confined to the right uh, vocal fold, maybe extending a little bit into the parotid space. Um, is this a video or just a picture? Just um, a picture. Just a picture. Okay. Um, it seems confined to the to the uh, right side mainly, and I don't see that it's extending at least from the picture subglottically or superglottically. Um, uh, so, yeah. and I see airway obstruction, obviously. Yeah, I agree with all those statements. I think there's a little bit of um, you know false vocal cord extension up here, and a little bit of fullness. Um, certainly, um, in the stroboscopic examination, which I didn't include for you know ease of time, there was some slight limitation of mobility, but not you know complete limitation of mobility. Um, so, Andrew, um, what when you see a lesion like this, do you, do you do you think about biopsying in the office, or do you do you take them straight to the OR? So I'll tell you that um, for a case like this, if I'm seeing it, they've been sent for consideration of conservation laryngeal surgery. And so I think the indications for office biopsy are someone who you know you're going to radiate. Because I think if you're considering operating, I do not think that that patient should be evaluated just with an office endoscopy because you gain too much by going to the operating room to palpate this and appreciate the extent of the tumor. You know, what is the mobility of that cricorytenoid joint? What is that extension into the ventricle? Um, and, and those pieces of information you cannot gain with the same, uh, you know, certainty that you would gain by taking that patient in the operating. So the only time I biopsy in the office is say this guy was 89 with multiple medical problems with this large T1, maybe T2 lesion. And we're trying to get an answer because we're going to get this guy into radiation. Otherwise, this guy definitely deserves a trip to the operating room, in my opinion, for a full uh, endoscopic evaluation. I, um, I completely agree with that and um, do exactly the same thing. Um, for, our, for our fellows and residents joining us this evening, um, this is a double channeled scope. I would highly implore you to learn how to um, biopsy um, 
you know, learn how to do in-office biopsies for the reason of facilitating patients faster through to radiation therapy, but completely agree with you. You can't, you can't minimize um, the information that you get from taking a patient to the operating room and planning for further surgery. So I did take a look into this in the, in the data and, and, you know, the office biopsies, even though the biopsy forceps are small, they, they do give you a result quite a lot of, you know, a large percentage of the time, 64% in this particular study, which comes out of my old alma mater at um, Boston Medical Center. Um, and certainly um, there's definitely a cost advantage to doing it um, in, the, in the office as well. So it's definitely something to add to your armamentarium if you haven't you know, already been trained in how to do it. So just quickly, um, a bit of a competition matrix here. Um, you know, obviously local anesthesia in the office, general anesthesia in the OR, you know, less cost in the office. There's more sampling error in the office and the time to result is less. So if you really want to get someone quickly to radiation therapy, it's a very good um, tool to have um, as part of your armamentarium. So um, I proceeded to a direct laryngoscopy and, you know, um, as Andrew knows, sometimes I'm a little bit colourful in my descriptions, as you saw in my prior presentation at Academy. And, and here, um, basically, all I'm saying is a dental guard was placed and, and um, you know, couldn't really get a good examination of the patient with the Lindholm. Um, then I tried the Dido, I tried additional manoeuvres, uh, tried the Louis suspension, and then essentially I got a monocular view through the Hollinger. Um, and I was able to see that it extended the full length of the vocal cord and up to the right false vocal cord. Um, there was no subglottic extension. I was able to take a biopsy and the frozen came back as squamous cell carcinoma. And I was surprised that they were able to tell me that there was invasion because you don't always get that on your, on your frozen section. So um, I'm going to throw this one back to Andrew. What, what are predictors of exposure? Do, do, you, do you look at the patient and have things run through your mind when you're um, in a situation like this in terms of, you know, how difficult it's going to be, how easy it's going to be? Yeah. Um, so, you know, there are different people who have published different things, whether it's the T's of exposure or, um, you know, Georgia Peretti and Cesar Piazza have put forth their laryngal oh. score <laughs> um, uh, in terms of what they're thinking about, um, you know, in terms of things to do. The big questions, you know, in terms of my mindset are, um, intercisal distance in terms of is there any trismus and uh, looking for uh, do they have uh, tori on the mandible yeah. you know how high is the larynx yeah. Um, yeah. any other pre-existing issues that may make that difficult as you were able to do you know you had to work through uh, the algorithm of scopes that you were going to get into using this with a monocular hollinger to get your view because you couldn't get it with a with the Lindholm or the Dito but I think you can have all those tools available and, and see and obviously that's going to change how you think about approaching this tumor potentially based on what that exposure is. Um, so. Uh, Diana, Diana, could you comment, do you use any other adjuncts during your direct laryngoscopy? Do you use telescopes to like a angle telescopes and such? Cause that's a great picture that you got there, but that may have been from the office. And I was curious what you use in addition to yeah. the laryngoscope access. Yeah, routinely we use a zero degree and a 70 degree scope, but once again, um, you know, it was very clear to me that that was something that I wasn't going to be able to remove endoscopically. And I always tell a patient um, when I'm taking them to the OR, I give them the option. I give them the option that I'm either just going to biopsy this, confirm the biopsy, but most patients want biopsy and treatment at the same time. So I tell them mostly that if I can access it endoscopically, I will try and remove this. I always have the CO2 laser um, set up and, and stand at the standby, but clearly that wasn't you know, going to work in my fave that day, but worked, I worked through the range of the scopes. I, you know, put the patient into neck flexion. I even tried to suspend to see if that gave me anything. I just really wasn't, wasn't getting much. So I knew at that stage that this patient was either going to go to open partial laryngeal surgery or radiation therapy, but I really love this Laringa score. I think it's a nice way of trying to determine laryngeal exposure. It's just particularly a nice score for the residents and the fellows too. So in this, um, in this paper and um, for the residents and fellows, uh, Cesara Piazza and his team out of Italy published a lot of study, a lot of studies on larynx cancer. So he's really one of, you know, one of the world authorities on, on these things, but um, the Laringa score is anything less than six, you're going to get a good laryngeal exposure 94% of the time. Anything greater than six is difficult laryngeal exposure 40% of the time. And anything greater than nine, then you're looking at an almost 70% chance of difficulty laryngeal exposure. And the things that they thought were most important 
were um, upper jaw dental status, macroglossia, micronathia, degree of neck flexion and extension, and, and BMI. Um, you know, in this gentleman, I, I, I was trying to um, understand at the time. I think if I was to go through this, he probably was just above a six, um, but it is, it, it is what it is. And it sort of delineates him down through the algorithm as to exactly what you're going to do with him. So in terms of workup, um, you know, obviously I, I, I definitely get a, a CT. I, I absolutely get a PET CT um, if they're going on to radiation. Um, that's definitely my, my algorithm in terms of, of imaging. Um, once I've treated the patient and then I'm monitoring them, then I'll absolutely get a PET CT down the line too. I, I don't know if everyone's in agreement with that. Would, would anyone like to add anything there in terms of imaging? Actually, I'll ask Kendra as a radiation oncologist. Uh, this looks to be like a T2N0. I'm assuming a dyno with no cervical lymphadenopathy on imaging. Um, would you need a PET on to proceed with radiation? Uh, this one has a little superglottic extension. Is that right, Diana? Um, uh, yeah, false, false cord. So it's still, yeah, still within the glottis. So Kendra, I'd be interested for like pure glottic lesions. Do you feel like you need a PET versus one that are, you know, can come across in the superglottis where you might want to think about radiating the neck? How do you approach these? So I think in general, uh, getting a PET CT is standard if you're going to be moving forward with radiotherapy. I'm not clear what the value is in the very early stage larynx in terms of, you know, the the predicted val the predicted likelihood of finding nodal disease um, for a T1 and zero is very very low. But what I have found is that in these um, exposure exclusive malignancies. The likelihood of identifying an additional primary or a tertiary primary in a patient who is um, going to be coming to radiotherapy is relevant and, um, and serves an important purpose, uh, an important percentage of the time. Um, I don't often use a post-treatment PET-CT in the early stage glottics um, because really your eyes are the best tool that you have. Um, I don't know if that addressed your question. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. So, um, if you, if you present, patient presented with a CT neck and chest, would you still get the PET or would you just go ahead and proceed with SIM and, and radiation? If it was referred for radiation specifically. I often do get the PET and it's um, because of the, the competing risks. Okay, Diana, please continue. So this gentleman, um, I mean, I'll get into this discussion, but there was a lot of to and froing about whether he should get radiation or open surgery. So he he did get a PET and that obviously showed the, the uptake of the right vocal cord. There was no lymphadenopathy seen. So staging here, he's, as you said, um, a T2, um, you know, uh, N stage uh, is zero based on the PET image on the PET. And so we're left with our management op options here, which really come from the NCCN guidelines and what we probably all agree on. He's either going to go to RT or the option is with this because he can't be exposed endoscopically to go to open partial laryngeal surgery. So generally what I do at my institution is I don't really think I can have that discussion about radiation very well. So I always send them on for a discussion to our, our radiation therapists and obviously discussion in a tumor board setting as well. So Kendra, what are some of the things that you discuss with your patients regarding the, the benefits, risks of surgery, the radiation therapy for a T2N0? Yeah, so this is a really easy tumor board for me. I mean, this setting is a really easy uh, uh, set of discussions because I think in general, anyone who can safely go to an appropriate margin negative surgery and have appropriate mm -hmm. laryngeal function thereafter should be surgically addressed. That's my position. For those who either due to function um, issues are gonna end up going to TL or are um, not able to get something less than a total laryngectomy and have elected for non-operative management in that uh, context, the focus is really on um, defining the extent of supra and subglottic extension to ensure that it's an appropriate candidate for so-called limited field radiotherapy, which is focused just on the larynx itself. This is a completely different and much less difficult course than most of the definitive chemo rad and definitive rad treatments we give in the aerodigestive tract. 
And the focus really needs to be on odynophagia and dermatitis. Um, I put these patients on high dose gabapentin. They use mometasone cream twice daily, which has been shown to reduce the absolute maximum acute toxicity in the skin. And we talk about a sort of six to 10 week window at the end of radiotherapy and in the aftermath of radiotherapy where the um, voice hoarseness worsens, the throat pain intensifies and the skin becomes highly irritated. Um, we talk about the treatments themselves, not having sensation lasting 10 minutes. And that I actually do daily image guidance with the early stage larynx patients um, and uh, their setup is in a long mask, which is immediately against the skin. Um, and we workshop whether we think it is likely to um, cause a significant problem so that we can be proactive about it. Miriam, how would this patient get discussed at Anderson and what do you think the recommendation would be in your disease team? So uh, at Anderson, a patient like this would be seen by uh, all, all the modalities. And I, I actually think that this patient would probably also end up uh, seeing the medical oncologist as well. Uh, it is a stage two, but there's some um, impairment in vocal cord mobility, if I understood correctly. Uh, so we, we would all have the opportunity to see the patient, to talk about what the treatment would be, and the patient would also be seen by our speech therapist. Uh, they would uh, almost certainly undergo a uh, stroboscopy to sort of get a full idea of the function, uh, as well as a, a careful uh, laryngoscopy and an intraoperative examination. Uh, in terms of discussion, uh, I mean, I think this would be one of those cases where um, you know, a lot of this would depend on the interest and the um, expertise of the surgeon. I mean, this is this case clearly can't be done with a, a, a laser. You don't have the exposure for it. I'm not sure that it's, uh, you know, certainly not ideal from that standpoint. Uh, so it would be uh, open partial laryngectomy versus uh, radiation or chemo radiation. Um, then. Uh, the results of that could be potentially quite good. I mean, one of the factors that would concern me as a, as a surgeon seeing this patient is it looked like there was a lot of posterior extension. And so if you're chasing a margin on the posterior commissure, that would make me pretty nervous. Um, the other thing is that this is definitely somebody I that should be considered for um, kind of a hemi laryngectomy as opposed to something like a super cricoid, which I am personally more, more comfortable doing. Uh, but I don't think a supracricoid is the right thing for this patient. Um, and then finally, uh, with a uh, with a partial laryngectomy, you know, you're going to be looking at the reconstruction is really going to uh, going to be what drives the vocal outcomes on someone like this. And so you really need to go to someone who is very good at that reconstruction. Uh, and so for me, I would probably send it to a colleague who does a lot of vertical partials, which are very rare at this point, I think. Thanks, Dinah. We've got three minutes. You want to tell us what you did or how your discussion? Um, so, yeah, I'll just breeze through it. Um, this was just a paper regarding outcomes, and it did say that outcomes were, were better with open partial laryngeal and CO2 in terms of laryngeal preservation. Um, so, I go through the indications here for open partial laryngeal surgeries. There's limited indications now, but it can be helpful, obviously, in poor endoscopic access and a limited recurrence post RT. You know, I'm doing an NCDV uh, analysis of some other larynx stuff at the moment. It's still being done um, in the United States. This is from 2010 to 2019. So I think open local excision is probably a variant of um, open partial laryngeal surgery. For this um, gentleman, vertical partial laryngectomy was, was what he had, but the other options for open partial laryngeal surgery, not in this case, uh, horizontal supraglottic laryngectomy. Um, in terms of vertical partial laryngectomy, um, the indications are, are really for a lesion of a, you know, a mobile cord. And this cord was still mobile. They can't have that much in the way of subglottic extension. It has pretty good local control rates. Um, you have to be very cautious if there's extension you know, beyond the glottis. It sort of becomes a no-no when that happens. Um, and if there's truly impaired, um, you know, almost verging on uh, a paralysis of, of core mobility, you should really be cautious in that because that does signify cartilage um, invasion. There, there's you know, several variants of this and the reconstruction is definitely with strap muscle rotation and imbrication. 
I won't go through the surgical steps. I think that you can all refer to that um, in this PowerPoint, but essentially we, we got negative margins on this um, all around, um, around the complete uh, cancer. It was a 2.2 centimeter. It didn't go into any of the, you know, the, the, the uh, ang angiolymphatic invasion rather and um, perial neural invasion was not identified. And then in terms of what it looks like now, I mean, I would be sort of somewhat critical of myself here that it could look a little better here on this side. You know, but it doesn't look too bad. He's cancer free currently. I know we're running out of time. Did you do a neck dissection? No, not for this, not for this. So um, I, would, I would also say that this is an excellent schematic from the European Laryngological Society on open partial horizontal laryngectomies that I would encourage everyone to look at. And finally, I do have some um, another reference here, which does give step-by-step -step anatomic dissections on open partial uh, laryngectomies. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Diana. Well, if you want to unshare slides and move on to um, Loriano. I just have a question for Kendra while I bring up the slides. Kendra, would you have irradiated the neck if you had done this patient as a single modality or would you have just done the primary as parallel opposing fields? Uh, yeah, I've, uh, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, fairly old school, if you're going to irradiate just the glottis, it should be parallel opposed fields. Um, you should do daily image guidance and you should measure the dose of the anterior commissure. Thanks. On day one. Loriano, take it away. So can, you can see my screen, right? Not a problem? Yes. Yeah, so let's see. This is a 55-year-old female with horses that has, 55-year-old uh, uh, female with horses that has progressed for the past six months. She has a pressed and a high-pitched voice and she was referred for from one of the local otolaryngologists for evaluation. No other, no other medical problems, no past history of smoking, only surgical history in the past is history of C-sections. So I'm gonna bring you two, two different uh, strobes and this is the same female, two different lesions so that we get our, our, our heads going. So it's the left focal fold lesion that looks like a, a leukoplakia. And this turned out to be a laryngeal or carcinoma, biopsy in the OR. And then we have this other patient who has a left vocal fold lesion that is referred like as, as a laryngeal carcinoma for evaluation and treatment. So, so first of all, what is the staging of these two lesions? Um, Diana and, and Andrew, patient one and patient two. I'll take patient one because it's pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a T1A. Okay, and Dr. McWhorter. Yeah, the other, you know, this is part of the limits of our staging system because yeah. these are very different tumors, but this is also a T1A. I don't think it's crossing the anterior commissure. We couldn't quite see it, but it doesn't, uh, I don't think so, but it's a large volume tumor in the anterior third which is a different animal in terms of functional outcome, potentially compared to what you had with the other one, but they're both T1As. You, you're gonna end up my presentation before I do it, before I, I go through it. <laughs> but yes, yes, so, so for the fellows out there, you know, there's a, a small T1 lesion versus an angry T1 lesion. Those are managed differently. And the discussions that have to be had with those patients about endoscopic surgery are completely different and, you know, um, who would send uh, the, the first lesion to a radiation oncologist? And I'm gonna let Miriam answer that. <laughs> you know, I think that first one is like, to you. <laughs> yeah, the, the first one I think is just perfect for, uh, for surgery. And uh, for me, uh, I like to do it cold steel actually without a laser. Uh, and it looks like it's gonna come right off. I mean, it's perfect for that. That is, that is correct. For the second one, a little bit trickier, of course, but for the first one, absolutely. Would you have the second patient dis have a discussion with the radiation oncologist before surgery? Yes. I, I, do you guys agree with that, Diana and, and Andrew and, and Kendra? Would you see this patient? Yeah. 
Well, I guess um, that's, I guess that's something to bring up is that when this lesion is that small, like patient number one, Laureano, I'd be curious, like, to ask some of our discussions, how do you approach the tissue conformation prior to excision, or do you excise with the presumption that it's squamous cell carcinoma because no, 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 your no. biopsy would essentially, you know, remove the lesion? So that is, uh, that is a, a great, great question. So, so I disagree a little bit with uh, Dr. McWhorter's sta statement that he would take you know, these lesions to the OR before surgery. I actually don't necessarily take everyone to the OR before surgery. Um, I agree that you can't get a, a, a grasp of a, a lesion for surgery completely in the office. But first of all, you know, I, I get a biopsy in the office in all of these patients, even if it's a small leukoplake, and I prepare the, pa the patient for surgical excision in the OR, okay? Um, if it's a, a small lesion that I think it's confined, confined to the epithelium, um, I, I, you know, I, I go through a thorough discussion of, you know, epithelial resection and KTP laser treatment. So I biopsy all of my lesions uh, in the office before surgery. If it's gonna be an extensive resection, like the patient number two, you know, then, then we, we have a, a different kind of discussion I send them to see the radiation oncologist, and then I have a second visit after we have a, 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 a you know the result of the of the the biopsy um, to to discuss what the patient uh, would want to approach in terms of uh, 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 treatment, you know, and see what what the voice result will be and and whatnot. So so I biopsy all of these patients. Let me see if I have a. Let me see this right here for a second. Let's see. So when I biopsy them, I topicalize them with 4% lidocaine and I perform, you know, a thorough endoscopy, which includes sort of an upper tracheoscopy. This is a bulky lesion with a saccular cyst. Um, this is obviously another patient, you know, but, but I try um, to, to look at the supraglottis and the subglottis um, from uh, the posterior larynx to the front. So I get a, a good idea of what the extension of the lesion will be before going to the to the OR, um, and and that's sort of uh, the way that I that I that I see things in my practice. So, um, following up on on Diana's data on in office biopsy. So um, this is from Seth Daly, and uh, he he did a small study on in office bios, biopsy of upper uh, airway lesions, and basically uh, they biopsy uh, ninety two. Uh, tumors transnasally and 24 uh, transoral biopsies were performed on uh, 116 patients and 97 out of the 116 patients had a diagnosis of uh, uh, malignancy, you know, doing in-office endoscopies with biopsies. So, so I fairly, you know, when you're doing, when, when I do surgery on these um, T1 carcinomas, I try to, if it's not a bulky tumor, I tried to biopsy it off in the office, um, Jeffrey, and this oh. is your question. I tried to avoid um, going to the OR without a, a, a preemptive tissue diagnosis, unless it's something uh, really small, just to prepare for the patient um, uh, for what the diagnosis will be at the end. You know, sometimes you can't get a full breadth of the lesion, and you get high-grade um, dysplasia on them or, or moderate dysplasia. But that'll give you an idea of what you might have, you know, at the end. And at least you can tell the patient, look, this looks like premalignant tissue and we'll probably go forward with the surgery to remove the lesion. And it might end up being, you know, a squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. I don't know if you like guys would like to comment on that, Andrew. <clears throat> oh, I think it's very doable. You know, I think it's, you can definitely, it's a high value technique. It depends upon you know, in terms of, I think a lot of that's your referral base in terms of how they're coming to you in terms yeah. of whether they didn't biopsy ahead of time or not and whether you need to make that. And then I think it needs to, for me, anytime I choose to do a procedure like that, it's whether or not do I think this is gonna change my treatment decision? You know, is this gonna be a decision point in terms yeah. of am I going left or am I going right here? And I, I don't think there's anything. I think it's a, you know, a perfectly fine way of doing it just based pretty much on how my practice is that I'm doing it. I think those tumors that you showed, I think that the, uh, the difference in the uh, Diana's original tumor is there is a lot to be gained in that lesion when you are uh, with that bulky, you know, large uh, tumor that was T1 then being a T2 from in terms of uh, 
like Dr. Liu said, in terms of looking with a 70 degree telescope, what is that roof of ventricle? What's the apex like? How deep does that go? If you're doing that resection, you know, are you going to be an ELS type five complete cordectomy, or is that more, um, you know, is not quite as endophytic as it appears? And those are hard to judge. Uh, you can be confused in the office in that anterior component, but I think, you know, I think it's perfectly fine. Uh, it's a great technique to be able to help make that treatment decision for the, in the office, if you don't have a diagnosis ahead of time, um, uh, for sure. The small lesion, I would just cut it off. You know what I mean? Because if it's yeah. just, if it's a leukoplakic lesion, if it's severe dysplasia or it's CIS or it's early T1, I'm going to give them the same treatment. Yeah. It's still, they're, they're still going to have a great outcome. Yeah. yeah. And so I just, ex I would just excise it. Loriano, um, your office-based biopsy strategy, is that a physician preference on your end because you find it expeditious or are there sort of, are there any systemic or financial considerations from the way in, the, in your practice environment that, um, you know, make this a, the best way to take care of things? That's a, that's a great question. So yeah, I'm, my, my practice is hybrid academic and hybrid private. So um, uh, one, I have three main considerations. One is OR time. I don't have enough OR time to, you know, I, I do a, a fair amount of laryngeal, endoscopic laryngeal cancer, like some of you guys. So I don't have enough OR time in between, you know, big head and neck surgery and, you know, thyroidectomies and all this and that to take these patients to the OR, or, OR for a biopsy. That's one reason. The other reason is I train in laryngology and head and neck cancer just as, as Diana. So I, you know, it's it's just ease of, of doing it in the office. I see the patient, you know, on a Tuesday or, or, or a Wednesday and I see him next week over, biopsy him. I already have a tissue diagnosis and he's already scheduled for surgery in the OR by the time I biopsy the lesion if it's something that I think we're gonna go forward with surgery. So yes. There are considerations. I don't look at it in terms of, I mean, um, a biopsy in the OR, uh, uh, monetary wise in Puerto Rico, um, uh, it's, you get built better for it than doing it in the office. So I, it's, it's just convenience in the way that I, that I do it in my practice. It's just easier for the patient to get him soon to the OR for surgery, basically. So, so patient one versus patient two, would you get a CT scan? Um, and I'm going to ask Diane, I'm going to ask Miriam, I'm going to ask Andrew. Would you get a CT scan on patient one? Absolutely not. Um, Absolutely patient, not. Yeah. <laughs> patient two, um, definitely, because it looks like it's creeping forwards up to the anterior commissure and you really want to see what's happening up, up there. What else would you, on an angry um, T1 lesion like this, what else would you be looking for in a, in a CT scan? Yeah, cartilaginous involvement, um, erosion of the inner um, cortex, um, and possibly less likely though the the outer cortices. I also look at the paraglottic fat, you know, and that's and I I discuss it with I I have you know my my uh, I have a group of head and neck um, radiologists here who look at my scan, so I ask them specifically to look at the extension to the paraglottic fat, just because I can sort of tell the patient you know what the extent of the resection will be. And this obviously would impact their voice outcome significantly. You know, if you have to take uh, a whole bunch of the muscle out and go uh, lateral to, you know, ligament and cartilage, it's, it's the different, the, the voice outcome will completely be different than, than, you know, not having to do that. So, so um, uh, what are, what would be the treatment options for these patients? You know, if it's a, and we already discussed this, if it's a large bulky, uh, T1A carcinoma extending um, lateral into, um, you know, close to the cartilage or deep into the muscle. I always discuss voice outcomes in them. I've had a few of those patients who, who you know, I send them over to the radiation oncologist and they have opted for radiotherapy just because, you know, I've, I've been clear that they're probably going to have a breathy um, a voice, you know, uh, and that's probably an irreversible thing after surgery. So we have a thorough discussion on voice outcomes. If it's a small lesion confined to the epithelium, then, then I'd probably go ahead with surgery. And again, I agree with not sending them to the radiation oncologist. I don't know if you guys agree with that or have anything to add. Can I make a comment here? Um, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I kind of feel um, that all these early stage glottic cancers should see the radiation oncologist and have a discussion as an option. Um, I agree the very first one is inc incredibly superficial, very favorable for surgery, but 
my experience has been more recently that I think patients just need to hear both options. Um, and uh, especially from, a, I don't know, around here, just like the medical legal standpoint, I think it's actually, I've looked into this a little bit. It's like, I think you actually kind of have to um, just kind of at least, you know, discuss that such an option and often recommend that they actually see them for the actual discussion about it. So, yeah. Um, Amber, Kendra, what do you think? I think that this is something that varies very substantially uh, depending on where you're at. If you have a radiation oncologist that's on your team, that's um, part of multi multidisciplinary care and who specializes in head and neck cancer, um, I don't think it's wrong. I would, um, I, I can't speak to medical legal, but I, I do think that a radiation oncologist that radiated that first lesion has not done the right thing. They have made an error. That is not a lesion that should ever be radiated. And if you're never gonna radiate a lesion, that is, I would refuse radiation to that patient without some other consideration. I'm not sure that, that a discussion is necessary from an informed standpoint. The other comment I will make is, um, though I trained in a very big place filled with many, many excellent people, I then went out into the world. And in the world, radiation oncologists, just like surgeons, uh, differ substantially. And so you could end up with um, in a situation where the information that the patient receives from such a consultation is, um, is bad. And as I said at the beginning, just as my disclaimer, um, in general, patients who can have uh, good functional outcomes with something less than a total laryngectomy, in my view, should always have surgeries. Radiation is a pathway um, uh, when you're talking about organ, uh, organ loss or if and when the risk for um, regional recurrence is, is high. Um, so I think in some settings, fine, but um, there are um, considerations that if, if someone sent me that first lesion, I'd be confused. Happy yeah. to have it. I mean, we're, we're not a, it's not, you know, if, if in the world outside of big academic institutions, if you send this patient to a radiation oncologist, they're probably going to get radiated. Yeah, they so, might. And, th and that's really what I'm saying is. So that exactly. And that's what I'm, and I'm going to ask, and I'm going to answer Summer. I agree with you um, in the, in the sense that you have to have this discussion, but our, my reality, uh, the reality of my practice is that if I send a small T1 lesion, and this has happened before, for you know a discussion with the radiation oncologist, they're gonna be like, okay, you, oh, you need radiation for this, right? Because this is what, what it, it's not an open discussion. You know, it's there's no back and forth communication. They just get radiated. So, so I try to avoid being in that in that position, especially with small epithelial lesions, you know, or or lesions confined to the epithelium. Um, I used to be so offended when people said that in open forums, and then I went into the world. Yeah. No, I no, I understand. I mean, I get referrals from community setting and radox and community that I know personally, so they'll send in cases. But I just think that, um, you know, especially for this for fellows and things, I think I really think if you if you have you know the ideal, you're always shooting for the ideal team, and the ideal team would get like a radiation oncologist like you, a head and neck, and laryngologist like you both, and then. But I, I do think it's important to keep in mind because if someone do goes and gets radiated for something that's tiny, sometimes I see patients there. I'm like, I saw the pictures. I really, I wonder why you didn't get considered for surgery. So, well, but barring all the local stuff, I think it just it is, you know, hopefully whoever you're out in practice, you can kind of team up with someone, and so, you know, patients yeah. might decide and vice versa. But idea, of course, understanding the realities of day to day. Yeah, no, and I understand your point is valid, completely valid. I think the fellows should learn, you know. Obviously, the discussion must be had by the radiation, the radiation oncologist um, when, when it's definitely necessary. I, I, I don't necessarily feel all lesions need to see a radiation oncologist, but um, yeah. It's At least you know that it's an option, and if it's anything glottic, because I, I think uh, this lesion, I think the glottic lesion that we, see, we saw before, I feel like would have went to radiation possibly at rush just because of the functional outcomes and, and that patient and, actually decided to get surgery and i'll show you what the functional outcome is but she was she was aware she wanted surgery you know up front because she she um, um had a discussion with the radiation oncologist 
and she didn't i mean she she was not convinced about the long term you know sequela so she ended up getting surgery with me she's been disease free for many years now so Loriano, we got about 1 minute if you want to Yeah finish yeah up. yeah we we over we over study so uh, for the fellows ELS, you must know this if you're going to do endoscopic uh, laryngeal surgery. I sort of try to avoid going beyond ELS type 4 just because the outcomes are not great. And this is when you get into bigger um, T2, bulkier T2 and T3 lesions. Um, we're going to skip this. So this is an early lot exquam. I treated this with a, a resection of the epithelium. And you can see uh, the lesion on the, on the right vocal fold the small squamous cell carcinoma. So basically uh, excised and treated with laser ablation. I use KTP in my practice. This is a T1B um, radiation failure. There's a patient of mine that I operated like seven years ago. He's around without um, disease. So I did a big endoscopic resection on him and treated his margins with KTP laser. Um, if these lesions are confined to the epithelium and you examine them well, you can try an upfront um, laser resection uh, without having to do laryngectomy. If that doesn't work, then you talk about TL, you know, and, and go through the process of, of, of getting through everything. If you look at, um, there's a, a couple of systematic reviews and data analysis. T1 glottic uh, carcinoma outcomes, uh, oncologic and voice are sort of similar. So um, even if they see a radiation oncologist, I always talk, discuss with the patient that um, radiotherapy on the long run, we'll have um, a more sequela than, you know, obviously endoscopic resection just because of vocal fold fibrosis. So initially um, their voice outcomes should be adequate, um, but on the long run, they might develop, you know, I, I see a fairly significant amount of fibrosis in my laryngology practice, you know, related to radiotherapy 10, 20 years ago. This has changed obviously because of IMRT and IGRT, but we still, you know, from time to time, I see a patient who gets Overradiated, Kendra. You can you can uh, comment on this <laughs> further on. Um, functional outcomes for endoscopic laser surgery are comparable to radiotherapy. And then this is the uh, yeah. This is a uh, the resection on this uh, patient with a large bulky T1 lesion. As you can see, she has. A significant amount of bottom confidence, no aspiration or or um, um cough with with liquids, which is something I ask when I see a big defect like this. And and then basically this is a a T1 uh, lesion with involvement of the anterior commissure. I just wanted to show the fellows we use NBI to see the extent of the lesion, right? And I also use the same technique to look at the anterior commissure where I sort of invert my scope into the anterior glottis, just so I can see subglottically and into the ventricle. Thanks, then, Mariano. I think we're running out of time here for your yeah, yeah. You want, well, I'm gonna make sure Sam, Samer gets his time. Um, while Sam is bringing up his presentation, I, I generally send um, anything that's more than an ELS um, type two and above, I generally send for a radiation discussion. Um, um, type ones generally not. And um, did you end up reconstructing that anterior glottic defect with anything, Laureano? I offered her a reconstruction, but you know she was not convinced. Um, I offered her actually. I, I injected her with Restylane, closed the the gap a little bit. She didn't do that great um, and wasn't happy with the outcome. So so I I offered her you know uh, medialization thyroplasty to see if I could push that over. But she wasn't into it, so no, she didn't get reconstructed at the end. But yeah, what I do, we do. I do discuss that with patients if they're cured for a long time. Yeah, that's so that type of uh, I that uh, that case. That was the defect I was kind of anticipating, and so I I actually had that on a result one time, and ever since then I was always wondering if the voice outcome. But I, as I'll show in my case, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of factors that end up putting patients into categories, and there are limited options. And sometimes, so it's, 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 uh, those are some fascinating cases, guys. I was, was, I'm really glad I got to see those. So I am not a laryngologist by training. So, and I know, and by no way claim to, to, um, I'm just the head and neck surgeon. Um, but I, uh, was going to show you guys, um, talk about a transoral case related, uh, superglottic. So, um, here we go. 
So uh, it's a 64 year old gentleman. He was uh, having some dysphagia for one year. He actually was seeing his otolaryngologist in the rural uh, Illinois um, who was treating him for sinus disease. And he had mentioned to him something about dysphagia. So he scoped him. And when he scoped him, he found a lesion on the epiglottis. He took him to the OR, performed a laryngoscopy, and it was uh, read as uh, squamous cell carcinoma, moderately differentiated. He's a 50 plus pack smoke, uh, smoker. He's a retired iron worker, and he described some kind of nuclear reactor that he was uh, employed at. Uh, his past medical history, none known. Um, he does have medical history, but he just had not much into it. So um, at this point, I know that he's had a squamous cell. Um, so he just came into my office with this report, and I got a phone call from his referring doctor. So first thing I said to myself is I wish I could have done that biopsy, as we had just discussed. So um, I'll just tell you about his exam. He was a dentalist. Uh, I happened to be able to see his epiglottic tip when I would look transorally, and um, I did a scope. I could not find this recording, but I have a picture of the tumor. So it was ulcerative lesion, and the way I described it was just on the lateral mid-epiglottis, so it was not on the tip, and it was not um, in the infrahyoid epiglottis and by appearance, and it did not involve the false cords, and the vocal cords were, uh, were fine, and he had a baseline raspy uh, voice. So this is actually the OR uh, picture of it, unfortunately. Um, and um, I think to our discussion here, um, we had already mentioned about looking. So in the office, this looked kind of just looked like a little regular on the epiglottis. It, it wasn't um, anything more to it. But in the OR, it uh, immediately looks different. So I saw Dr. Liu's eyes light up when he saw that. So it, it's a, it looks pretty exophytic, looks pretty like a nasty squame. So, um, Stammer, just for clarity, so this is a lesion confined to the right AE fold with minimal lingual uh, epiglottis, right? Right epiglottic uh, laryngeal surface, not okay. the AE fold. Great. Okay, and then you can see in this picture, here's the true cords down here in the distance, a little mucus over them, okay? Um, so imaging with this. So he already came to me with a biopsy. So uh, um, if I, you know, ideally I'd do a, I'd do a laryngoscopy. But, so uh, Miriam, what, what, what imaging do you usually start off with and what specifically are you looking for often for this, these superglottic lesions? If I saw somebody with that kind of cancer, I'd be like, oh, I really hope there's nothing in the neck. Um, you know, to try to, we don't see cancers like this that often. Um, but I would, I would start with a, a CT scan. Uh, I think that would be the most helpful. I mean, we often do get, um, PET CTs as well, mainly to, uh, determine, uh, the presence of lymph node metastases. And if it's, it seems like it's an N zero, uh, that would make it probably, it looks like a stage one, probably, um, uh, superglottic cancer, and he would be considered for surgery. Okay. What if there was a single lymph node anyway? But it's like a small two-way, unexciting, no E and E on radiographically. Would you still consider surgery? So that's a great question. I mean, uh, with with one lymph node, sometimes we consider just doing a neck dissection, and if it's just one lymph node, it's very small. There's no E and E you might not need radiation, uh, but larynx cancer still makes me kind of nervous. And, and for me, that, that would push me towards considering radiation once you consider radiation. Uh, I'm not sure that there's that much benefit to doing the surgery. I think the patients, our happiest patients are the ones that have surgery alone. Uh, so it. with the one lymph node, I would, I don't know. I mean, I think it's an option. It's just, I think that I would be, everyone would be happier if it was an N0 neck. Yeah. Stanford, tell us more. Okay, so he actually got a CT scan done in rural Illinois. They were read it as normal, no lymphadenopathy, and they never mentioned anything about a lesion in the larynx. Um, he had a, a CT chest, which was read as uh, emphysema and some scarring. So I was looking back at a CT. I could see something here on the epiglottis, kind of in that mid-epiglottis, um, almost, almost to the tip, but it's, it, on, you know, this is kind of a representative of what I was thinking, seeing on exam. Uh, one thing I'll notice, you'll notice is, I don't know to the group, but, you know, I could see his epiglottis in the office and I just feel like there's something about his molecular here, just a little favorable. It's almost 
like the epiglottis is stuck for it. And you'll see here in the OR, I think it plays out a little bit. So, um, you have the T1 and 0 out of the gate? Yeah, T1 and 0. Um, so he actually got a PET CT because he had come from the outside. So I wanted to get some kind of imaging in my institution so I can just take a look, a good look at. And so on the PET CT, you can see there's some hypermetabolic activity in the um, epiglottis on the right. Um, I was actually looking at how low that activity looked. By the hyoid, it, there's zero activity. It's very clear. Um, and then I also like this PET CT uh, because of what we were just talking about in terms of the neck. So in, I do you really just need that CT, but if I'm going to make a decision because there's so much riding on potential lymph nodes and, and that, I actually like having PET CTs uh, and I, I look at the cancer primary, but also just to look at the neck, what's going on. So, Anybody have any thoughts about that? Yeah, CT is also great for looking at that pre-epiglottic pre fat as well, which looks really preserved in this gentleman. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then I, I keep saying here, so now his PET CT shows some opacity in his lung. So I think that's important to keep in mind, right? Um, so we'll go to staging, uh, T1, N0, M0 with the PET. Um, he actually already had, you know, when these patients come from rural Illinois, there's, I have like a network of people that they see. So um, they did see a medical oncologist, see a radiation oncologist, um, could not coordinate him to see our own team at the main campus. Uh, and what are your what are your thoughts? I guess in terms of treatment. Um, they, Cameron, can I clarify your slide? So transoral resection with or without neck dissection. What was your recommendation for the neck management? Yeah. So we discussed this case at Tumor Board. Um, I guess I would say that there is a good discussion about this patient. Um, it's all about exposure. I wasn't going to take him to the OR for a second anesthesia just to make sure that he was a favorable exposure. Clinically, I, all my indicators suggested that he was. So my thought was, if I take a patient like this to the OR, do I take him to the OR and do the one-hour supraglottic resection or less, or do I sign him up for the bilateral neck dissections and, and all that comes with it? So with the constraints of OR time, um, uh, I always kind of think about these for patients. There's also the uh, potential that you don't get good exposure or you don't get a good margin, then you can kind of maybe save them morbidity. So um, to, when thinking about the surgical option to our um, discussions and panel, how do you guys approach these? I mean, you just, when you have this discussion, I know it's not a common tumor, but- um, Yeah, you... Miriam, Miriam, how do you take this forward? Do you offer- um single episode of care with resection and bilateral neck dissection, do you stage it? Yeah, Did you yeah. Bilateral so, necks? I'm so glad you asked. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, classically, we would do surgery, we would do bilateral neck dissections. Uh, sometimes, I mean, I think people do fine with that level of surgery. I think the, especially if you do transoral laser, and I know you're going to talk about the robot. I mean, I've done it with the robot as well. But I have to say, I really prefer using the tra uh, transoral laser for something like this. Uh, but anyway, um, so, um, you know, doing the bilateral neck, people do fine with it, but it's, it does feel like a lot of surgery. And so everybody is thinking about, well, can you maybe, because it's lateralized, maybe you can just do one neck. Um, so this is what I came up with. I think it was actually on the last one of these that I did. I did take them to the OR um for uh, to assess the exposure and during that um assessment uh, i injected um i injected uh um dye you know uh for a lymphocentigraphy uh to see what the drainage was going to be uh then we woke the patient up a uh, patient went to the uh scanner uh to determine where the sentinel lymph nodes were uh, they were ipsilateral. The following day, the patient had a, uh, had surgery uh, and underwent a transoral laser and a unilateral neck dissection. And so that's how I did it. Yep. It is a little bit more onerous in the sense that um, you know you have to do this extra procedure, but it really does help to to know that you have the exposure that you need. Um, and even let's say um, you know you do the lympho and it turns out there. Uh, their exposure is really poor. Uh, some of our guys and our, ra our radiation colleagues are um, 
avoiding contralateral neck radiation if there's unilateral spread of disease for some of these superglottic uh, tumors. So it's something that's being considered. I think they're thinking about doing this on study. Um, so it's something like that, which would be great, you know, because you can sort of withhold uh, radiation or surgery to one side of the neck if you have that information. Kendra, if you're uh, rating this patient primarily as a single modality, would you do both necks for sure? Or would there be circumstances where you would try to avoid the contralateral neck radiation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the so this is actually a matter of uh, style preference and training. Um, I think that um, the radiation oncology hip neck group at MD Anderson is one of the most adventurous when it comes to unilateral irradiation of, um, of uh, true superglottic larynx, even um, other subsites of the uh, aerodigestive tract. Um, the last, when I, when I worked in a group with um, many MD Anderson trained uh, radiation oncologists, there's just a lot more um, interest, flexibility, uh, bravery when it comes to unilateral irradiation. From my perspective, salvaging failures in that context is um, really uh, very difficult. And it's not entirely clear to me how much less toxic it is to omit part of one side of the neck when you're having to target the entire um, or a large portion of the superglottis. So um, I, uh, I have avoided offering unilateral uh, radiotherapy when you have a tumor that really has, you have really good data, they're precocious from a nodal perspective. Um, I think the difference with surgery is that if later there's a recurrence in the other neck, you have surgery and you have additional salvage options. Going back and giving um, salvage radiotherapy to a recurrence in the post-op salvage neck is not as um, straightforward as, uh, um, yeah, but you would have a variety of, of perspectives on this, most of which actually lack any form of prospective data. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Can I, can oh, I make a comment? Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add. You know, I ha I've been at Anderson now. I think it'll be on, in my third year. So, you know, maybe I don't know everyone. I feel like they would all do bilateral back radiation. Uh, and the, the rationale for doing this study is because they don't want to. Yeah. Uh, but they feel like they must. Yeah. So, okay. That's all I was going to say. No, that's helpful. Thank Here's you. The, I mean, it's, uh, I've always, so I remember a tumor board. So, you know, they're going to be, it's potentially high cure rate. And so we're trying to avoid dual modality. So when we're talking about the risk of surgery, I kind of feel like I'm saying a risk is that you still might need radiation. But at this point, um, early on, you know, I was always worried. I said, listen, we're, we're being very clear with the recommendations. We don't want to do dual, dual modalities if we don't have to. And if you're trying to avoid radiation therapy, then you have the surgical route. But one of the risks of that, and honestly, the more you do, the more you realize, I, I just don't know what the results are going to show unless there's some obvious indicators or the CT showing big indicators. So this was actually a big discussion because the idea of doing single modality radiation, the neck dosing was pretty low. I think he was even talking about like localizing it to level two and three. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's hard for us to, I think this is a, even though it, to me initially is like such a straightforward case, there's not a lot of data about this. And I think everybody's trying to avoid doing multimodality treatment and especially multimodality treatment to the regional neck. You know, you don't want to do neck and then radiation. I think that's the big thing. Um, and it's just hard to predict. And I hear, I would love to do DLs. I think it might be worth doing that repeat DL. Um, as Dr. Lango mentioned, if you could do sentinel lymph node and we, that always comes up nowadays, um, that makes sense. And if it's part of a workflow where it's got, might even help if you do non-surgical treatment, that's, that's fantastic. But um, I could see that working because it kind of helps both angles. I will tell you that a lot of these patients, I mean, I, I, as a surgeon who pushes for this and loves to do robotics, I, I told them, listen, you meet with the radiation doctor. This is so gray in terms of like, you know, the what ifs and the, 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 the reality is his voice quality would probably be really good with just radiation. And he'd probably do pretty well through treatment if it's done by a head and neck focused radiation. I mean, 
I think you walked through it. Yeah, we got about three minutes. Why don't you tell us what you did? Okay, so he refused radiation because of his prior employment. He was just like, I'm not um, going to do it. So we had to do surgery. So um, I'm going to skip these. These are just showing you that there's really no good data. These are some of the UK guidelines. They're just like good recommendations. Um, so in the OR, first of all, I want to say everybody who's going to do this, you should intubate nasally. I don't think it's done. I think that's critical. So even if you're going to do your laryngoscopies, get them intubated nasally and take a look. So that's how you really know their exposure will be. Um, then do your laryngoscopy immediately. And then you use the TORS or the rate laser. I prefer TORS. Um, and then I did offer him staged necks if he wanted. You know, I think you could schedule him for a three hour surgery and then a one hour surgery versus like, you know, things can take longer and issues. So take a look at the larynx. I definitely made sure the commissure is clear, the false cords look clear. Um, so we did the OR. So it's kind of a good exposure. So I would have not liked to not be able to, but when you see is like, the, I can't get that molecular to get that epiglottis very clear. And I'm already knowing that this gentleman does not want another treatment. I and mean, he was adamant, you know, I would have, even if it was open. So here I just showed this, you could see kind of moving the tube around. This is probably one of my first or second SP cases when we got the robot. So it's a little clumsy. Um, just, to, just a couple of years ago, but you can kind of like see the tumor there. It's kind of confined to the epiglottis. Um, let's go to the next. So we make our cuts away from the tumor. So I kind of, I know the tumor's on the right epiglottis. So I kind of pull that away and I'm making cuts down low on the E fold, but I can't get that epiglottic, uh, infrahyoid epiglottis out easily. So, um, you know, this is like, looks maybe cool in the robot, but like at this point, I'm like clinking with every move at this point when you're at the superglottis. So every move kind of shakes the screen. So it's actually kind of frustrating. So I knew that there was this epiglottic uh, like cyst there. So I was able to get out of that. And that on the initial scopes was way far from the tumor. So this, I was kind of using my exposure. And then here's a little further down. So really with the robot, technically, I think it's, it's very easy. If you can get exposure, it's literally, you can pull the epiglottis out. Now there's other techniques uh, where people split the epiglottis and go down the middle and come out laterally and kind of get that exposure. But I think if you intubate them nasally, you have this exposure, you're just kind of skiving down towards the base of tongue. I made some minor cuts at the base of tongue just to give me some release. And I'm literally just kind of working it out with the robot. Um, I think for proper exposed patients, you can see, I keep kind of checking back, checking myself. I'm also, I edited a lot of video where I'm looking with the telescope, to, if I have any questions to just make sure am I far enough as I can be. So after you get some of these lateral attachments from the epiglottis down to the hyoid, you see you kind of get, you start really pulling the epiglottis out. Nothing too fancy there. Um, and then here, so here's kind of my final cuts. You can see, I could see the ET tube. Here's the inner retinoids. There's like an edge of tumor. In the robot, you get a 3D view. So you can actually see a little better, I think, than these uh, views. But we're working it out. And um, I think this is the final cut. Yeah, so work, uh, we come around the um, pre-epiglottic space. And I did not even, uh, so there's the tumor compared. Thanks so much. What did you do for the next? Did you do bilateral next stage yeah, or? Bilateral uh, next. So here was the final cuts. Um, this is the final look. This is a picture of the tumor when it's uh, in the pharynx with the robot holding the tip. And you can see here, it's pretty close there. So once I'm done with this, I actually I took off two pieces from the base of the epiglottis on the right and the left, frozen section and for permanent, uh, all negative, just minor salivary gland tissue. Stays in the hospital four days. Sees, I actually have him see SLP before um, and, and uh, final diagnosis T1, good margins uh, without adverse features, 37 negative nodes, a close observation. This is him. This picture in the background is like two weeks after surgery. So still a lot of healing granulation um, and then 20 months post-op. It's kind of nice. I, you can see there's like a little but you don't want to leave too much, but you don't want to take too much. So you don't want to take into the false cords, I don't think, because that's what they're using uh, to help protect their airway and, and eating and voicing. But then also you want to, you don't want to cause stenosis. So I actually, this was a nice result. And one of the risks of doing something like this is that if you injure the surrounding tissues, you might cause a superglottic stenosis, which is a real problem, um, especially if it's radiated. You know, one thing we didn't talk about for the fellows, 
we, you know, the big thing that we used to all this here talk about is aspiration risk with supraglottic laryngectomies and do you have lung disease and can you walk upstairs and do all these things? It didn't come up today, but um, I think we have to keep in mind the potential for aspiration. I feel like with these, when I think of these surgeries as kind of, we're just coming in, not touching anything except the structure we need. We're not disarticulating anything on the way out uh, per se. Um, functionally uh, do really well. And if you leave the four false cords and their cords are moving well, they can protect their airway. But part of the reason why I sat back and did not tell this patient, I really think you should have surgery. I think you should consider both options is because technically he has bad lungs and he's technically someone that may not tolerate aspiration. So it would be easy to look at me and say, hey, why'd you operate on this superglottic patient with lung disease. So we, we didn't talk about it much, but I maybe I overthink it sometimes, but I don't know if anybody has any comments on that. I think that was great. I've been sitting here waiting to play the laryngology card, you know, and I think, you know, you talked about your preoperative evaluation with speech pathology and with an epiglottectomy, that is a very rehabilitatable defect, you know, compared to a formal superglottic and the risk of aspiration. But as you said, I just want to reemphasize to the fellows, pulmonary function in these people, you can't hurt them making sure because they all want to aspirate, especially if you go more, you know, if you've been, you're able to reserve that pharyngoepiglottic fold and the descending branch, you know, to the piriform sinus there. So they've got good sensation in the piriforms based on where you made your cuts versus if you had to go a little bit more laterally, you know, through that trifold area could be very, you know, a lot longer rehab than the four days on swallowing. And so doing, like you said, as I'm talking about the importance of preoperative evaluation with speech pathology, having them practice their superglottic ahead of time, I think are really keys to helping these people get functional results. We could talk all day about the next because that's a great topic. Um, but well, I definitely think you need to hit function in lungs just like you did. Well, I want to thank everybody today. It's about 8.08 p.m. I want to thank all of our speakers, Diana Kirky, Loriano Geraldez, and Samira al Kudari, as well as our discussants, Kendra Harris, Andrew McWhorter, and um, Miriam Lango. You can see from our uh, multidisciplinary group today, it's both um, team-based for um, radiation oncologists and surgeons, but also surgeons of head and neck and laryngology variety that there's a lot of many considerations in these spaces to get patients their best outcome, both from a functional and oncologic standpoint. So I want to thank all of you for being here today. Our next session will be November 2nd, which is endocrine, the good, bad, and the ugly thyroid lesions. So I look forward to seeing everybody next month. Um, thank you again to our discussants and our presenters, and look for, thank you again, all right? We'll see you in a, in a month. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Great job. Good. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.